Good afternoon, all of you. Uh, here, Digambar Londe, precious scholar from VNIT Nagpur. I'm presenting my work uh, related to an event-based analysis of vegetation variation and its teleconnection with ENSO and IOD. So the vegetation is the most important parameter and which is very quickly affecting due to the climate change. Suppose there is a drought, the first thing which is affecting is the vegetation. If there is a flood or when there is a good precipitation, the first thing which is affecting it is the vegetation. So it is very important to analyze its dynamics in connection with the uh, ENSO and IOD. So ENSO and IOD are the those climatic phenomena which are affecting the climatic pattern or climatic shift in the uh, overall world. So these are the contents which I'm going to uh, explain. <clears throat> so coming to the introduction, so this study and analyzes the event-based uh, vegetation responses to ENSO and IOD uh, using MODIS data. Then the, the diverse vegetation patterns are coupled with the annual shifts in vegetation photosynthesis activity lead to the fluctuation in vegetation phenomena, uh, phenology. And the, these impacts and teleconnection of the ENSO and IOD on vegetations are analyzed utilizing remotely sensed NDVI data. So this is the study area. The study area is the upper Vima subbasin, which is the one of the subbasin of Krishna River. And uh, these are the micro watersheds, which are uh, seen in this figure. <coughs> so in this uh, watershed, there is a Sayadri mountain range, which controls the mount, uh, monsoon precipitation, which contribute to the highly diverse climate with, uh, within the study area. So the total geographical area of the study is 46,000 square kilometer. So these are the data sets used and the methodology. So the data used is the MODIS data mod 13 C2 data product, which has the special resolution of 0 0.05 degree and the temperature resolution of 16 days. <clears throat> so this is the e equation which explains how the NDVI will be calculated by using the bands which are recorded by the remote sensing data. So coming towards the ENSO and IOD. So there are two phases in ENSO and two phases in IOD mainly. Uh, actually, there are three phases, El Nino, La Nina, and Neutral. Uh, but Neutral is the phase which we are not studying. So El Nino and La Nina events. So El Nino is nothing but the warm phase of the ENSO and La Nina is nothing but the cold phase of the ENSO. So depending on the sea surface temperature, these two uh, events are uh, defined by the scientists. So when the average sea, sur sea surface temperature is, uh, suppose in a year there is a sea surface temperature which is above average sea surface temperature, then that event will be uh, called as a El Nino, El, Nino Southern, El Nino event. And if that temperature is below uh, sea surface temperature, average sea surface temperature, then that event will be known as the La Nina event. <clears throat> so based on the oceanic Nero index, the suppose for the continuous five year, it is more than the 0.5 or less than the 0.5, less than minus 0.5, then those events are considered as a El Nino event and La Nina event respectively. So this is for the positive, uh, positive and negative IOD events. So similarly, uh, as ENSO events are related to the sea surface temperature, IOD events are related to the uh, oceanic water. Suppose there are uh, there is a cold water which is pushed toward the eastern Indian Ocean, then that uh, event will be known as a positive IOD event, and vice versa, that will be the negative IOD event. So based on these events, the monsoon cycle within India and Australian coastal line will be controlled by these events. So similarly here in the uh, for considering positive IOD events and negative IOD events, uh, these dipole mode index is used to uh, identify the uh, positive IOD phases and negative IOD phases. Suppose there is a uh, DMI value which is more than 0.4, then that will be known as a positive IOD event. And if that is in opposite, if that is a less than uh, 0. Point, minus 0. 0.4, then that will be known as a negative IOD phase. So as the study is related to the event based, so the events are calculated based on the 
ONR, ONR values and DMR values. Suppose, suppose in the uh, ONR values, in case of ENSO, July 2002 to February 2003, for continuous period, the ONI value is more than 0.5. So that will be the considered as a Alnino event. So these are the events which are considered for the analysis. So coming towards the NDVI data pre-processing in ArcGIS, the mod is mod 13 C2 data product has been downloaded and pre-processed in the ArcGIS software. So the <coughs> pre-processing includes the conversion of the data into the vector formation, then vector formation to the classification, classification, then classified uh, NDVI values are uh, according to the, according to the NDVI values, the classification has been made as a less than 0 0.3 NDVI, 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 NDVI and greater than 0 0.5 NDVI. So these classification are such as sparse vegetation, moderate vegetation and dense vegetation. To understand the uh, homogeneity of the uh, NDVI values, so these three classes are considered for the analysis. Coming towards the Results, so the special variation, first I'll show this figure. So this is the uh, special variation of vegetation NDVI during El Nino events and La Nina events. So we can see that the El Nino event, which is the warm phase of ENSO, it is affecting largely t uh, in the vegetation. They, that red color indicate that the very sparse vegetation, which has the NDVI less than 0.3 and in Lanina event, we can see that that red portion is reduced, and in last Lanina event, which is very recent, uh, recent Lanina event, which which is the which is from August 2021 to January 22, uh, which is showing uh, dense vegetation. Also, it has been uh, observed that the seasonal effect has been uh, seen in this. Uh, vegetation uh, analysis, uh, vegetation outputs. So in that uh, last phase, we can see that that event has been started from uh, August, which is a monsoon to the to the January. So that seasonal effect is also uh, considered. So these are the uh, percentage area within the study area, which is calculated for each class. Here we can see that uh, in El Nino event and La Nino event, both the event, the mod moderate uh, NDVI is major area is covered with the moderate NDVI. But in <coughs> El Nino event, we can see that the sparse vegetation has the maximum area as compared to the La Nino events. So this is the special variation of vegetation over uh, the study area during IOD events. So IOD events as considered the positive IOD years and negative IOD years. So these IOD years are considered, uh, which are given by the Bureau of Meteorology Australia and also those uh, DMI values. So here, actually many researchers are uh, concluded that positive IOD is affecting uh, Indian uh, India in positive manner means they are saying that the positive IOD causes flooding in uh, India. But in uh, in this study area, we can see that during positive IOD years, that <coughs> southern portion of the of my study area, it is having very less vegetation. Means it is very sparse, sparse vegetation. So we can see that, that uh, in this study area, it is not uh, uh, affecting positively, as many researchers have concluded. And in negative IOD years, we can see that the moderate uh, <coughs> vegetation, many of the many of the uh, large area is covered by the moderate vegetation. So these are the uh, percentage area which are calculated from the special variation maps. Here also we can see that the major area is covered by the uh, sparse vegetation, uh, the moderate vegetation, and sparse vegetation is more during positive IOD events as compared to the negative IOD events.
so these are the conclusion of my study the study analysis the comprehensive assessment of response of vegetation to enso and iod events so while analyzing it is observed that the almino event which is a warm phase of enso has predominantly negative impact on the study area as compared to the lanina event and similarly it is observed during the iod events which is positive iod event is affecting negatively as compared to negative iod events and the major portion in this study area it is actually the uh, the upper vima sub basin which ha which has the five agroclimatic zones one is the western ghat zone then there are two transition zones and then major area is covered by the drought prone zone so in that drought prone zone the uh, vegetation is majorly affected by the almino events and positive iod events so these are the references thank you bias in the vegetation ndvi data it is not biased as such like global climate model data ha huh. mm -hmm. oh. global global phenomena which are affecting the regional level local seasons will be more influenced but these are the global climate uh, global phenomena which are affecting the global uh, local regional climate okay, thank you one more question the values of ndvi is about the ndvi classes yes that is that is of the actual ndvi or the ndvi annual no those are the actual ndvi so the difference ndvi is your consideration so that was actually that paper is already under consideration which i i did the study related to the uh, by considering the seasonal analysis means 3 3 months uh, combination hello good afternoon everyone my name is vaipthi i am a phd scholar at indian institute of technology iit indore today i am going to uh, discuss about the topic investigation investigating the role of horizontal winds uh, in understanding the extreme precipitation event a case study of 2018 kerala floods so in recent years there has been various studies that uh, estimates that the, there is an increasing trend in the global precipitation and uh, they attribute that uh, warming climate is an main factor that results in the available of the higher precipitable water and the ipcc report 2000 and 2002 and 2007 also emphasizing in understanding the extreme precipitation event so there is a recent study by uh, samantha ray Uh, which uh, uses the 72 years of imd uh, global graded rain uh, sorry imd graded uh, rainfall data over india so they study the uh, interannual uh, variability of the daily rainfall and they also consider the interannual variability of the extreme rainfall event so they uh, consider threshold of 100 uh, mm so wherever there is a, a rainfall of 100 mm or more they count the number of uh, events and they see that uh, there is an increasing trend in such kinds of extreme rainfall event so when it comes to the uh, extreme rainfall event so kerala is one of the uh, most flood prone area because of its uh, geography and topography so there are uh, if you can see here that uh, there is a, a western ghat on one side of the kerala on the uh, right side and there are various studies that really relates the orographic lift orographic lift uh, further enhance the precipitation event so this kerala flood 2018 was a very uh, devastating flood in the uh, state so there has been various studies that uh, study the various parameter like the synoptic condition uh, moisture transport and uh, vertical velocity but uh, there has not been uh, much studies which uses the doppler weather radar or any other ground based uh, measurement so since the uh, winds plays an important role in such kinds of uh, events in transporting the mass movement and moisture 
so when we uh, say that the wind observation, so there are multiple sources we can get the wind. So satellite based observation, radio sound observation, and the model wind. So satellite observation, we can get the scatterometer uh, winds also. Recently, uh, ISRO launched an ocean set three satellite that gets the surface level winds. And uh, these winds uh, will get at the surface level and they have uh, wind variability uh, when there is a heavy precipitation. And when it comes to the radio sound winds, so uh, we get uh, twice a day uh, at zero hour and 12 hour UTC. And we have other model winds like NCMWRF and ECMWRF provides the uh, wind. But they has a limitation of the uh, limited spatial coverage of uh, 9 kilometer and 25 kilometer, depending upon the uh, uh, location and region you are using. So in that case, the Doppler weather radar plays an important role. And uh, India holds a good network of Doppler weather radar, around nine, uh, 37 uh, Doppler weather radar. So Doppler weather radar basically provides the three dimensional volumetric observations of radial velocity and reflectivity. So these observations are high in spatial and temporal scale. So uh, every 15 minutes, we can have a uh, observation, a 3D observation uh, in dual polarization mode. So in uh, past, there has been various studies that uses the uh, radial velocity. So Doppler weather radar basically works on the uh, Doppler uh, effect. So it only measures the radial component of the velocity of the precipitating particle. So the uh, past studies uh, shows that we can get the horizontal or basically the local wind field using the uh, uh, obs radial observation. So that's the uh, whole objective of the present study that how we can use the Doppler weather radar wind observations, radial winds obs uh, radial velocity observation in order to estimate the horizontal wind field. And the radar is located at the Tumba, the rocket launching site at the uh, 8.5 degree north and 77 degree east. So the uh, in order to uh, briefly say about the data sets that are used, so the IMD graded daily rainfall data that is at 0 0.25 spatial resolution is used. And the uh, radius on the observation is taken from the University of Wyoming for the Thiruvananthapuram station that is nearby the uh, radar location. That is the nearest site available. And the TELS Doppler weather radar data is used. So the data is used in PPI mode. So PPI mode basically means that the radar scans the concentric circles and the observations are available on the conical surface. And there are the uh, these are the parameters that are listed. So the Doppler weather radar can, uh, the, this TELS radar can act, uh, can work in the two modes. One is the single PRF, PRF mode and one is the double PRF mode. So in double PRF mode, the resolution is 150 meter that we are using the double PRF mode only. And in that case, the maximum range is about 250, 250, 240 kilometers. So the metallurgy is briefly uh, described as a flowchart here. So first of all, we have the uh, Doppler weather radar uh, radial velocities. So these are the raw radial velocities. So whenever we have Doppler weather radar observation, then because of the uh, surrounding, we can have some kind, some kind of clutter. That clutter means that some artifact is there, if uh, aircraft is there, or if some fixed target is there, then these are you know, attributed to as clutter uh, clutters. So in order to use the Doppler weather radar observations, we need to go for the uh, quality control. So quality control basically uh, involves two main steps. One is the clutter correction and another is the velocity DLL. So velocity DLLing means that whenever uh, this, as I already told that this is based on the Doppler weather, uh, Doppler effect. So based on the uh, maximum velocity that the radar can measure. So beyond that velocity, if the particle has that velocity, then that velocity will be underestimated. So that problem is known as the velocity folding. And we need to uh, apply corrective measures in order to deal with this challenge. Once the uh, data is quality controlled, then we are applying the two methods that are used to generate the uh, winds. One is the known as VAD method. VAD is known as velocity azimuth display method. That gives the uh, 3D, not 3D profile, that gives the uh, vertical profile over the radar only. And then we are also using a uh, method that is given by Zhu et al. 2006 uh, that is known as single Doppler method. So that gives us 2D uh, winds, but that on a conical surface. So where basically the idea is that uh, if we have at a constant height and constant range, the uh, there will be a circular observation. So when we uh, when we plot these observations at a, a, a as a ray, uh, azimuth, then we'll have a sinusoidal nature, and then we can use the uh, Taylor series expansion in order to calculate the local wind field parameters. But there is a limitation of this method that this can only give the profile over the uh, radar location only. And in order to have a comprehensive uh, 2D uh, analysis, we can go for another method that is known as volume uh, 
velocity volume processing. So in literature, the vo velocity volume processing method has several disadvantages. Like uh, this method involves estimating the linear uh, parameters, but uh, this considers that the wind, uh, wind fields are linearly varying, but that is not always the case. So there is a study by uh, Zhu et al, as I already mentioned, that they use a 2D cross-covariance co co functions in order to estimate the uh, uh, wind field at a conical surface. So they use the background error covariance method while using the bad winds as an initial guess. So in order to come to the result, so first of all, we analyze the uh, rainfall, uh, uh, IMD graded rainfall data over the Kerala region averaged from 70, 75 degrees to 77 degrees and 5 degree north to 12 degree north. So it shows that the uh, peak rainfall was uh, around 14 uh, of 15th of August. And the spatial distribution of the rainfall shows on the right, uh, right hand side that uh, almost uh, most of the districts uh, having a rainfall of about more than 200 uh, on 14th and 15th of uh, August. So in order to understand the precipitating system, we also create a PPI plot of the uh, radar reflectivity. So as we can see that uh, the GIF can all, you can also see from the GIF that the system is moving southwesterly. And one of the interesting point here is that the systems are building on the uh, over the Arabian Sea and moving towards the uh, southwest. And uh, we can see that at 7, 5 UTC, that uh, second row, uh, second plot, that there is a frontal system, means a uh, curve-like of structure is there, that is a frontal system, and the maximum reflectivity observed was about 40 dB. So in order to investigate the structure of the precipitating system, we also create a max z plot. So max z plot means that we have a reflectivity uh, observations. Uh, it's a 3D observation. So whenever there is a maximum reflectivity, we have uh, plotted that. So you can see the top panel of this plot shows the uh, variation of reflectivity along with the longitude. And this shows the variation of reflectivity around the uh, latitude. So we can see that there was a high reflectivity cloud of about 10 kilometer at that time that results in such kind of heavy precipitation. So as I already mentioned, the uh, aim of this study is to understand the horizontal winds from the uh, DWR observation. So we have created a VAD profile for, from 432 UTC to 127 UTC. And the corresponding uh, radio sonde observations are also plotted in red, as you can see, uh, for 12 hour, uh, 7 minutes. So uh, in the lower uh, troposphere, uh, till five to six kilometer, there was a good match. But as we go away, uh, as we go at a higher altitude, there are some mismatch. Uh, there can be uh, multiple factors like uh, the uh, radio sonde observations and uh, the DWR observation. They are not accurately time matched. Like the observation at radio sonde observation is at 12 hour, but the DWR observation is at 12 hour and 7 UTC. And uh, what is the important point from here we can infer is that at the lower troposphere, uh, lower troposphere up to six kilometer, we can see that there was a high uh, winds of about five to 50, 10 to 15 meter per second. So there is a study by uh, Subramaniam Kumar. Uh, they also analyzed the same Kerala flood event uh, using the ERA-5 data. So they conclude that there was a low level jet at that time uh, that brings the moisture from the Arabian Sea to the uh, landmass. Also, we can see that as we go from uh, to the uh, above six kilometer, that is still eight to 10 kilometer, we can see that the wind speed is decreased and this, contribu uh, this contributes to a decrease in the wind shear. And that contributes to the vertical development of the convective system that time. So after that, we also try to estimate the two dimensional uh, wind field. So you can see that on the uh, left hand side, that is the observed radial velocity uh, from the Doppler weather radar. And on the uh, right hand side, you can see that the uh, color represents the radar reflectivity. And the vector represents the uh, retrieved horizontal uh, wind fields, but at a conical uh, surface. So you can see that uh, if we are going far away from the radar, so it means that if we are going away from the radar, so these observations are at some particular altitudes. So it's like we are representing it in a 2D surface, but it's a, a conical uh, observation. So we can see that, uh, as you can see from this black curve, that uh, there was a convergence at that particular point where uh, there was a frontal system. So that convergence uh, will enhance the development of the convective activity. So to conclude that uh, uh, this study analyzed the 2000 Kerala floods and uh, degraded data and the Doppler weather radar observation. So Doppler weather radar observation shows that the system were moving from the southwesterly direction from the Arabian Sea to the Indian landmass and have a precipitating cloud stopping to 10 kilometers. 
we also uh, extracted the dwr uh, reflectivity so sorry dwr uh, derived uh, horizontal winds and these winds are compared with the radio sonde also so the main factor that was uh, that can be understood from this point uh, this study is that there was a low level jets as it was also seen from the era data also and there was a, a wind shear apart from the wind convergence uh, at, at the frontal system so these study can be uh, used in the uh, regional modeling because the yeah that's right yeah so at last we would like to thank the uh, moste uh, for providing the doppler weather radar data and the uh, university of warming for providing the radio sonde data and the uh, this uh, this work was supported by the Sp uh, space application center tech isro and mos nrl program uh, conical wind, no, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we, these wind speed are not at a fixed altitude. These are at a conical surface. We are just reprojecting it. So this method retrieves on a conical surface. We are currently in a process of developing an algorithm that generates it at a different altitude. Velocity and yeah. So we apply, we apply the technique given by the Zhang. That is a 2D automatic uh, uh, wind speed correction, uh, de-aliasing correction. Ha, so method basically it look for the uh, continuity in the wind speed that it should not abruptly change. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Basically, sir, our aim is to uh, develop a technique that can generate the horizontal winds from the Doppler weather data. So that is just a test case that we are trying to uh, implement that what are the applications of these wind fields. And in order to validate it, yes, you are correct that we can also look for the cases where there are no such extreme events. So we can analyze that also. Yeah. No. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Shivika Saxena, I'm a PhD scholar from GISL Motila Nehru Institute of Technology, Prayagraj. And I'm uh, giving my talk on the topic that leveraging multi source earth observation for high resolution mapping of precipitable water vapor. So, precipitable water vapor is an essential climate variable and um, it's a an, very important precursor of rainfall in the weather forecasts. Um, these are the contents of my presentation. So, um, the figure one uh, shows my study area, that is a portion of or in, uh, a small INSAR window um, in the state of Uttarakhand, uh, which has a very complex topography uh, with mixed climate patterns. So that, that is the major uh, objective of choosing this area. And uh, we have a radio zone station and GNSS station located at Dehradun uh, in this small window. So um, the major objective is to uh, integrate complementary techniques, that is GNSS and INSAR. INSAR uh, by INSAR, I mean uh, interferometric SAR. So uh, complementary techniques integration used for uh, generating high resolution PWV. So high resolution water vapor analysis can be done from a very limited, um, uh, from, um, uh, from uh, in an area where limited meteorological data sets are available. So um, INSAR actually gives us um, very uh, important insights about the small scale variations in PWV, which can be apparent only in the high resolution maps in PWV. If we use a uh, high resolution temporal, um, high temporal resolution GNSS data, we might not be able to look at this information. So this information, I will uh, speak like uh, the information, water vapor information from INSAR is actually turbulent mixing of water vapor that is coming here. And from uh, the um, our um, GNSS, and other sources, we get the non-turbulent component. These are the data sets used. Um, ERA-5 data set, reanalysis data set, uh, Sentinel-1A single look complex data set, uh, GNSS meteorological data, a MET file, 
and um, insat 3dr um, data which uh, gives us pwb uh, this is insat 3dr sounder data so we have these data sets at various uh, resolutions so we are trying to use a multi earth observation in one scenario so in insar meteorology basically focuses on uh, the phase difference that is obtained from uh, an interferogram which is the output of the insar processing okay so interferogram is the vis visual representation of uh, phase difference between two or more sar images um, taken from slightly two different positions at different acquisition times okay uh, so phi um, int means uh, the interferogram phase difference that can be uh, divided into uh, atmospheric phase noise that is atmospheric phase screen aps and uh, some other sources of um, uh, phase difference like um, uh, topographic phase and etc and some noise so our concern is the atmospheric phase screen phi um, atm which can further be divided into tropospheric delay as well as um, ionospheric delay so I'm using Centilin 1A um, SLC data set that is essentially C band data. So ionospheric delay is very less. So we can ignore that here. Because of high frequency, ionospheric delay is actually uh, inversely proportional to square of frequency. So uh, we can um, ignore ionospheric delay and we can finally focus on tropospheric delay, which will give us the water vapor information. So um, I'm converting my wet uh, sorry uh, tropospheric delay can also be um, visualized in terms of two components one is coming from the wet portion of the atmosphere that is water vapor one is coming from the dry portion of the atmosphere because of dry gases okay so uh, finally we reach to the water vapor component that is uh, phi wet now this phi wet is uh, converted into differential zenith wet delay coming from the insar uh, and finally, to our um, observable of interest, that is precipitable water vapor, differential precipitable water vapor. So the pi factor is used uh, to convert ZWD into PWB. And this pi factor is a function of weighted mean temperature in the atmosphere. So we use TM models, our own uh, design TM model for Uttarakhand state uh, uh, from my previous work to, for this conversion for uh, better accuracy. This is my overall methodology followed here. So um, basically, I started with the INSAR data set. That is the main data set used in my study. And uh, uh, I've selected few pairs for six months, March 2021 to August 2021. Um, then interferogram generation, uh, that whole processing I went through in the for software environment snaps. And uh, then I did some enhancements. Um, like um, Goldstein filtering and multi-looking, all those things. And then I finally unwrapped it. So the unwrapped um, information coming from my, the interferograms, differential interferograms, gives us the differential total, plant total delay. We arrive at the wet delay from the uh, previous slide information, just like that. And um, the hydrostatic delay, that is the dry information coming um, I have to remove it from the total delay to get the wet information. So that dry information, I'm taking it from the reanalysis data set, ERA-5. And uh, then I finally arrive at the INSAR PWB. The interesting thing about in INSAR PWB, differential PWB, is that it gives only us some partial information. It is not full. It is, um, you know, it has a uh, that unwrapping of the interferogram has actually introduced some unknown bias to it. So we ha either have to calibrate it using other measurements to get us the real information or we have to use some models to fulfill it to bring us to the full in atmospheric information. So I'm using the calibration method. So INSAR differential PWB is calibrated using the data from GNSS. So from GNSS met information, the uh, signal delay, wet signal delay, I uh, developed my GNSS differential PWV at the same acquisition times of the uh, interferogram generated. And then I calibrated and then finally I um, validated using the INSAT 3DR PWV data 
okay um i also do some pre event pre rainfall event validation change analysis uh, using um, in, uh, indian meteorological department imd uh, rainfall data gridded data to see just before a uh, rainfall what was the P, uh, pwv scenario which was captured in in the image just one day before so pwv and rainfall are really correlated with each other if there is a rainfall going to happen then pwv is going to give very high values okay so that kind of pattern we have also seen in our results so this is the calibration of insar pwv using gnss meteorological data so uh, what we trying to do here is that this is the gnss station here and uh, this is the cutoff angle used in the gnss processing so this along with the 1.5 km of lower tropospheric height we are trying to make a gnss cone and this uh, and the insar pixels lying within this gnss cone are averaged and then added to the uh, you know uh, the bias is added to the uh, these are calibrated using the pwv gnss data these are my results so the rmsc between the insar and the insat values for differential pwv uh, lies um, um, around uh, 3.6 millimeters which is fairly satisfactory for my case and uh, the rmsc between gnss and insar values is 0 0.7569 millimeters this is fairly um, low and good for my case study. Uh, we can see that this date, 14th August uh, and 26th August, this is a differential inter uh, PWV value um, from the GNSS, from INSAR, from INSAT. And this is a very good uh, results we are getting for the pre-event date. So the event actually happened on 27th August. So the picture was captured, atmospheric picture was captured in the um, INSAR data from 26th um, August and um, we can see good results. These are my high resolution maps generated from, the, uh, from using the high resolution INSAR, INSAR data calibrated using GNSS. So fairly high values of PWV we can see. Uh, in the next image, which shows a scenario just before a rainfall event. Uh, so excellent agreement is witnessed along uh, among all the data during the 14-26 uh, August duration, which represents a pre-event scenario. Uh, the rainfall happened was 90 millimeter, which is a good amount on 27th August 2021. So that event has been captured in INSAR data. And um, as of now, for future work, after I submitted this work, I've developed a lot on this. So I finally arrived at all this data is differential, means the date PWV values are actually the difference between two accusation dates. So what we want at the user end is the absolute value. So absolute PWV maps now can be generated at a very high resolution data using um, multi-temporal INSAR techniques, which I'm, I have attempted and uh, I'm about to <laughs> write and submit. Um, so um, we have got good results for that. And the calibration thing that we did for in here, I have actually developed um, water vapor, Zenith water vapor delay uh, models for um, capturing the non-turbulent portion, which is not coming, which is not captured in the INSAR data. Thank you. Um, actually, um, the one that is uh, that was openly available to me was the only one station at Dehradun in my um, study window. Um, but we can utilize actually the whole state. I'm working on the whole state, which has currently 13 uh, GNSS stations um, in the course ne network developed by the Survey of India. That I'm currently working on. So this was the test window I started my work with. Uh, now I have to stop the work.
Yeah, yeah, APSC. Yeah, that's what I'm developing on that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very nicely. Yeah. That's what I've moved on to multi temporal now. Uh, so that's the thing about extra that uh, revisit visit, uh, period is uh, right now in my case it's 12 days and because I'm using Sentinel 1A data um, uh, the good news in the presentation in the plenary session was that it is going to be reduced to three days so um, good news for mythology <laughs> using INSAR because uh, yeah, that is a drawback for INSAR data uh, right now. It could be, uh, we were actually thinking about using 1A and 1B that could give us a revisit period of six days. So that was a possibility. It had um, various issues related to it in the processing. Um, but uh, yeah, the thing is that, uh, yeah, if we are lucky enough that uh, rainfall event hora are able to capture it um, in, because the rainfall event has PWE values uh, variation uh, in the temporal vicinity of that event. So even during the rainfall, the PWE values would be higher. Uh, it will not suddenly drop. Uh, and even after the rainfall event, there might be some residual PWE which would be showing that rainfall event. So all those things, possibilities are there to capture. And uh, if we use the models for Zenith wet delay and PWB that I'm talking about, combining in SARN, we can come up with a multi Earth observation model, which we can actually use at our, um, you know, what you'll say, at our um, end, like uh, at our freedom. <laughs> I don't want to. Okay. So, as everybody knows, one of the main effects of the climate change nowadays, among the other things we have seen here in this session, is that the increase in the number and the severity of the wildfires. So here, for instance, you see uh, one of the news we had about the, uh, the the fires that took place here in India in one of the newspapers in, in Spain. So just to, to give you an idea of the importance and how these news are affecting all the world, okay? So in essence, what we have observed in this particular case in Spain, but they, as I said, the wildfire activity has been in the last year. So our idea is basically, first of all, to try to uh, predict the extension of the fire of, uh, of, this, uh, of this extreme, because it has been shown that uh, one of the main uh, characteristics of these new fires and the, and the, the, the threat of climate change is that they, they are increasing in size. So we wanted to study which are the processes governing the uh, extension of this, of this wildfire. So in, the classical, in a classical approach, normally in remote sensing, people, what they do is they take different variables and they try to uh, predict the, the extension of the wildfire. But in most of the occasions, the people are... In this case, what we were trying to identify is the importance of the jet stream into the uh, into the extension of the wildfires, because one of again one of the main effects of the climate change has been the uh, changes into the into the jet stream, especially in the northern hemisphere. Okay, what is the jet stream? In essence, jet stream are the upper atmosphere winds. Eh? To put it simple, so what we have we have we have the areas of high pressure. We have the areas of low, low pressures. So this generates a lot of winds. So normally, in a normal situation, before many years ago, many years ago, what we had is that this, these winds okay, are more or less parallel to the equator. So one of the things that have created the climate change is a meandering of this border. So what we are observing is that high pressures are going to the north and low pressures are going to the south. For instance, one of the episodes 
which were uh, important uh, one or two years ago were, was the effect of very low temperatures in the US. We had temperatures below zero in the area of Texas, which is quite un abnormal, okay? In Europe, we are suffering also in that case. This summer, we have this meandering effect that we, we had severe floods in Greece and in Spain, and in the middle of Europe, we have extremely high temperatures. So in this particular case, we want to see if the jet stream had an effect on the on the wildfires of the uh, that took place in India uh, last year in 2022. So we wanted to in, try to get the impact of this variable. Of, of this variable. How do we want to do that? At the moment, as we don't know which model or which processes are governing all these, we thought that maybe machine learning approaches, because they are able to interact with nonlinear interactions, were able to extract not the not the model itself, but the importance of the different variables. Okay. We didn't want to rely in a physical model, which may have some limitations with uh, dealing with, the, with this non-stationarity, because in the past, we, don't, we didn't have this. We have only these behaviors since a few years. Okay, so which is the data we have used? First of all, we have used for modis, we have used the extension of the fire. Huh? This is a classical variable. To uh, study the, uh, the jet stream, we have used the upper atmosphere uh, variables obtained from NOAA, and apart from that, we are getting and other, other types of variables, other variables that, of course, are affecting the extension of the wild of the wildfires. We are uh, using meteorological data for the EMCWF, is the European Climate Medium Weather Forecast uh, Institute, is the institute in Europe for climate studies. We have using soil moisture and vegetation obtained from from radiometry from one institution in in Spain. We are getting land cover to see if the type of land cover is affecting also the, the extension of the fire the elevation, distance to roads, just to, to, as a proxy of the human of the human effects. And here you have the variables where we have been uh, observing soil moisture, vegetation optical depth as a way to measure the presence of vegetation, vapor uh, pressure deficit as shown before, land surface temperature, uh, anomalies in the in the upper atmosphere, elevation, and so on. And here you have which are the different resolutions. Remember that here we are dealing with one application, climate application. So therefore, we are not really concerned about doing that for the moment at very high spatial resolution. We wanted just to see which is the effect of these variables, which determine the jet stream. So, which are the area of study? We basically are considering between April and May 2022 here in India. So we are considering uh, fires in India, in Pakistan, and Myanmar, which are these red dots plotted in here. So from there, what we had is, from MODIS, we had more than 30,000 affected pixels where we had the fire. So in order to simplify a bit the data uh, and to facilitate the analysis, we uh, binned the data at one hectare resolution. So we are considering fires and that level of, of, of resolution, okay. And at the end, all this process end up with a bit less, a little bit less than 1,000 fire events that we want to study, which is the effect of the different variables on the extension of this uh, of these fires. How do we take into account the, the jet stream? So basically, for the different location of each fire, okay, what we have or what we make is a, a collection of temporal images with the different variables that basically uh, consider the information of the jet stream. Basically, is the uh, direction of the winds and the uh, anomaly of the uh, the anomaly of the, or the geopotential anomaly at the height of 500 hectopascals. So the idea basically is to see if also the temporal evolution of the or the temporal information of the jet stream affected the extension of the okay? Because remember, what we uh, want to study is these winds and particularly the meandering effect due to the climate change. In which tool we are using that? We are using the different variables, classical land surface temperature, vapor uh, 
pressure deficit, soil moisture, BOD, etc. Okay, of course, the information about the uh, the jet stream. We are using the classical division, training 80%, testing 20%, and of course, our our output, our uh, or the, the variable we want to predict is the extension of the fire. We have used a framework based on machine learning. Indeed, we are not interested into the technique. Okay, we are interested only into the variable. So we were using support vector machine, uh, three basis approaches, random forest, CG boost, DVR, neural network. I mean, after uh, this analysis, maybe we could go to more advanced techniques, but at the moment, we don't care about too much about which technique we want, as I said before, to see the influence of, of these variables of the jet stream, which has been almost never considered. So how do we consider the, uh, the effect of the uh, jet stream? So here, what you see is the uh, spatial temporal a uh, spatial temporal composite of the two variables we are using for uh, for controlling or for measuring the jet stream, MCI at 300 hectopascals and delta Z at 500 hectopascals. So basically what we were doing is considering the fire at T0. Okay, the fire takes place at this, at this position. So what we were observing is that the evolution of the jet stream, we observe that approximately six days before the, the event of the fire, essentially one week, what we observe is that there is, a, there is a big anomaly on the area. And this anomaly, what it prevents or what it makes is a, the condition of the meandering of the, of the jet stream. So basically, with this, we can control where the, um, where the, uh, how to say, where the uh, top of the jet stream is going of this way of the jet stream. Just to see with one example, okay? This is an actual fire, sorry, one actual state of the, of the upper atmosphere. So here, in these areas, what you see here is the situation of low pressure. And here you have the idea of, of the areas of high pressure. So, in a normal situation, we would expect the jet stream to be more or less parallel to the equator. Okay, so basically the low temperatures will stop at this point and the high temperatures stop at this point. But what happens due to the climate change? Essentially, the jet stream has become crazy and the areas of high temperature are going up and the areas of low pressure are going down. So what we are observing, basically, what these areas of uh, high pressure is creating is what they are called heat domes. So here, what we show is the situation of the jet stream, land surface temperature, and vapor uh, pressure deficit. So as you can observe, at the, uh, up to now, the people were using the land surface temperature and the vapor uh, preficit, uh, pressure deficit as a proxy to analyze the wildfire. Okay, but as we see, the conditions that are establishing these stream temperatures or this stream of these problems with the vapor uh, pressure deficit is indeed the jet stream. So we have tested the different uh, the different classific uh, the different prediction algorithm to extend the fire, and here you have the main result. So the basic message of this slide is that the if we include the information about the jet stream, which is indicated in blue in this plot, we increase the accuracy in which, with which we estimate the extension of the, of the wildfires. And we increase the accuracy in a 10%. Also the errors, okay, uh, are, uh, are in here, and the errors are lower with the jet stream approximation. We don't, as I said before, we are not really interested into the tool. Here you have the five tools. Okay, and normally we are considering the easy boost because it's the, the best, the, the best given the results. Yes, the final results. We also did a segmentation on a small, medium, and large fires. And what we see here is the following. With jet stream, the error in the low fires is very high. 
24%, because these dead fires are very small, so you commit a lot of errors. But the important fires are the medium, which are 6%, and the large fires, which is about 9.42%. If, uh, if we eliminate the jet stream, the error on the uh, low fires increases to uh, 26%. For medium, it increases uh, to 6.62%. And the, uh, for, for the large fires, it, uh, it uh, increases to 10.66%. Uh, so as we can see, including the jet stream, the, as a proxy for, for, for the extension, we improve the estimation of the extension of the fires. So just to conclude, uh, we have uh, used various uh, machine learning algorithms okay, to predict the extension of the fire, considering by the first time the just the same information. And in essence, we can see that independently of, of the technique we are using, we are able to improve the estimation of the extension of the world fire in about 10%. What we have not done is just to use the jet sim. We have used all the collection of the variables. Of the, of, of, all the variables. So therefore, okay, it is important to consider these variables because at the end, uh, what the, the, the physical effect that produces the temperature to rise, the problems with the vapor uh, pre, uh, pressure deficit is indeed the jet stream. Okay. For the future work, we want to use new machine learning techniques, which are a bit uh, more accurate. So we, we want to use uh, vision transformers. Okay. And especially what we are doing now is to try to see if we see the, the, the same behavior in, in, other areas, in other areas. Indeed, we are now uh, exploring this, this approach in the whole European continent. Our next step is also to explore in Australia, where you have extreme fires too, and in Canada, where you have uh, uh, big areas. And the, our idea is to see in all these areas, the uh, increase in the extension of the of the wildfires is governed by the by the jet stream. Okay, here I finish my presentation, and now I'm open for questions. Thank you. Yeah, it's six days before the fires. Uh, no, this is at, at uh, this, this this is not in ground. This is in the upper atmosphere. This is the situation in the upper atmosphere. Yeah. No. The, uh, yeah, the heat down is because you have here the, the high pressures, the high temperatures. It's like kind, it's a kind of oven at the end. So basically, uh, what it provokes is the increase on the land surface temperature. So the effect of the high pressures on the upper atmospheres is the increase of the land surface temperature. Uh, this, I honestly, this I cannot tell you because the expert on uh, this particular effect is Amir. I mean, he's because he's a climatologist. Okay. Uh, after 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 that, we, we can discuss. Okay. Okay. Then back to speaker once again. And uh, last talk, now. Is, uh, Sir, Sakana, and Jana Madhavan, Numerical Relation of Tape Alvito and Vishal, sir, over Newton Lee using a nested WRN. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I am here to present my preliminary work on the numerical simulation of surface albedo and temperature over New Delhi region using WRF model. Uh, these are my contents, introduction, research objective, introduction to WRF model, 
introduction to his workflow and model configuration and some of my results. Uh, as we have all know, surface albedo is just a ratio of the reflected irradiance from the hemisphere and LST is defined as a land surface radiative skin temperature measured from the sensor direction. Uh, as as you have all know, these two uh, these two uh, parameters are very much interlinked as they they determine the ex extent of how much energy is reflected out from the sun out to space. These two uh, these two parameters are interlinked as as they determine the uh, energy out from the sun absorbed at the earth surface. So there is need of accurate simulation of these two parameters to monitor the climate and the and detecting trends. So for doing that, one such numerical weather prediction model is needed, is needed and uh, the WRF model is very much used by the various researchers in this field. So this is my research objective to initialize the WRF model using suitable physics parameters in order to simulate the simulate these two parameters over NCT Delhi. So some of the introductions of the WRF model. As you have all know, a WRF model is a state of art, measure scale, numerical weather prediction model designed for atmospheric research and operational forecasting applications. WRF model produce simulation based upon the actual atmospheric conditions that is from the observations and or the ideal situations. So WRF model is pr provide a platform for the urban climate simulation by combining all the microphysics options, planetary boundary layer, radiations and uh, land surface canopy, all the all the meteorological parameters to, to predict or to simulate the meteorological parameters which we, we need according to our work. So coming to the simulation workflow and uh, of the WRF model, first the initialization step of started with the inputs uh, that is static geographical data and gridded meteorological data. And these two, these two gridded uh, inputs are used in the WRF model. First is, uh, and these, uh, these two input configurations, we, we not need to input in the model itself. And if you, if we want, we can do that also. Starting from next step onwards, this GeoGrid uh, executable, executable file is to create the WRF domain. Uh, it may be, it may be one, one one nested or two nested according to our uh, study and uh, these are the input parameters which i have used in this study and second is ungrip data uh, executable this ungrip is used to extract the meteorological data and its required fields in the input domain which is generated by geogrid then uh, this geogrid and ungrip is uh, mixed and uh, and uh, the uh, we can uh, interpolate this uh, meteorological data in the horizontal directions and the vertical directions of the uh, generated domain by geogrid this is uh, all about the pre-processing steps in the wrf model now coming to the simulation part then this the input of the real uh, executable and the after combining all those pre-processing steps we come to the wrf simulation and this is known as the wrf itself and these were the physics options selected for this uh, for this study according uh, from the various literatures i have referred for this study area and the physics physics options is basically used in simulation to update update or to change the dynamics of the upper atmosphere, which is which we also don't know how the atmosphere will how able to behave on the on that particular day. This is all about the simulation part. Then 
after that we get the final results in the form of net cdf format and and we can also do the pre process post processing part by visualizing the uh, visualizing the output from in any of the softwares in either in lcl viewer or panoply uh, these are my uh, simulation results uh, uh, this is all about the uh, domain domain itself and uh, as you have seen the clearly high temperatures is indicated from the simulations that is 296 kelvin to 302 kelvin and i i also related uh, these results from the albedo albedo part also as you have clearly seen uh, that the overall domain uh, albedo is about 16% and which is very much lower than the overall northern indian albedo which is uh, about 24% and I, I I also validated these results, simulated results uh, from the uh, metallurgical IMD stations, which is uh, which is situated at the two locations in Delhi. And we have seen the overestimation from the simulated temperatures at about three to four degrees Celsius. And this is maybe due to the uh, upper upper atmosphere conditions, which is taken care in this WRF model simulation. So uh, coming to the conclusions part, this uh, this physics model is best suit for the uh, simulation of temperature and the surface albedo in the specifically in the NCT Delhi region. But the radiometric quality of the results it's at the very coarser side. Uh, to uh, to overcome this limitation, we have used a subset portion of the New Delhi region by using nested WRF um, capability. And uh, in order to mitigate these high temperatures and uh, to increase the albedo uh, around the study area, the one more important factor which which we can uh, use uh, is the use of refractive. So uh, I'm Dhruv Desai from Nagobai Vipatil College of Pure and Applied Sciences, Vallabhidhanagar Anand. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Invest 2023 committee for accepting my uh, work. And I would like to present my work here. So uh, my title is Retrieval of Atmospheric Water Vapor Using Band Ratio Method and its Validation with Modis Satellite Data. So first of all, I would like to give the brief introduction about the atmospheric water vapor. That uh, water vapor is an important parameter in studying the surface atmosphere interaction. Uh, it is one of the main contributors in the greenhouse effect. It plays a vital role in the understanding of the Earth system. It plays a significant role uh, in the cloud formation, which is important for the uh, 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 climate. It is an indicator. Uh, it is an indicator of atmospheric uh, uh, instability and can help uh, to predict the weather patterns. Uh, the changes in the uh, the rapid changes in the atmospheric water vapor content is a key, uh, key indicator in the climate changes. Uh, can you please move to the next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 there are many ways to estimate the water uh, estimate to atmosphere uh, uh, to estimate the atmospheric water vapor content. That is, uh, remote sensing is the most reliable technique for the retrieving water vapor at the regional and the global scale, using which we can analyze the weather patterns at the larger scale. Uh, there are many passive imaging sensors that can be used for the retrieval of the water vapor. That uh, first one is the advanced space form thermal emission uh, and the reflection radio uh, meter that is known as ASTAR. Uh, second one is the advanced very high resolution radiometer that is also known as AVHRR. Uh, and the third one is the moderate resolution imaging spectral radiometer that is known as MODIS. Here I have validated my water vapor retrieval data along with the MODIS data, uh, MODIS satellite data. Yeah, please, uh, next slide. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, uh, may, uh, a good retrieval method should uh, satisfy the following requirements. That uh, first one is the low sensitivity to noise, uh, which means the uh, in which the method should aim to the reduce the impact of the statistical errors in the channel. The second one is the low sensitivity to atmospheric variability, where the method focuses on the relative changes between the different channels or the components rather than the absolute values. Uh, this can uh, help to minimize the impact of the atmospheric variation on the research. And the third one is the low sensitivity to surface characteristics, 
in which the method considers the relationship or the ratio between the different measurements, which can help to eliminate or minimize the influence of the surface characteristics on the result. Eventually, the ratio technique, a band ratio technique, is chosen as it's satisfying these requirements. Uh, please, next slide. Yeah. Uh, band ratio, uh, band, uh, band ratio technique uh, uh, is the use for uh, detecting uh, water vapor absorption uh, of the reflected solar radiation, and the technique relies on the principle of the differential absorption method, where the absorption due to water vapor is estimated by the comparing radians in the water vapor absorption and the non-absorption channel. Uh, the methodology portion uh, in in which I would like to say that the studies I have chosen to apply our method is Vallabhijanagar Anand. Uh, which is the central region of the Gujarat in Western India. And it lies on the latitude 22.549 and the la uh, longitude 72.925. Uh, the satellite and in-situ data has been collected on the February 8th, which was likely towards the end of the winter season uh, in, the, in this region. And the temperature during the season uh, varies between 27 to 35 degrees Celsius. Uh, in the study, uh, the Motron simulation were performed for the location as we selected the three absorption channels, 0 0.905, 0 0.935, 935, and the 0.940 as the absorption channel uh, in the micrometer uh, in the micrometer range. And the uh, one window channel has uh, has selected as the uh, 0.865 micrometer. Uh, can you please move to the next slide? Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but the judges are seeing directly to come to the result. Okay, okay, directly, uh, directly on the result. Okay, okay, okay. Please, 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 uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the methodology in which I have uh, selected the band ratio channel, which means simply, I, I would like to explain that the band ratio means the ratio of the uh, absorption channel uh, of the water vapor in the uh, spectra and with the uh, window channel of the uh, spectra. That, that, that's the basic uh, uh, meaning of the band ratio method. Uh, uh, without wasting much time, I would like to go to the result section. Uh, can you please go there? Yeah. Oh. Yes, this is the uh, basically a ratio method. Yes, yeah, that uh, equation R R twenty R nineteen uh, was uh, so in the yeah, asking yeah. next next one yeah next one. This is the methodology section. Please move ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, they are actually asking to explain this. Okay, 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 okay. Here, that uh, band ratio is the technique which is used in the detection of the water vapor uh, absorption in the reflected solar radiation. This method depends on the principle of differential absorption method, where the transmission in the specific wavelength absorption is a uh, channel is estimated by taking the ratio of the measured radiance in the channel with the radiance in one affected wind per channel. Uh, uh, please uh, go to the back slide. Yeah. So this is the ratio of a uh, two-channel. Uh, the two-channel ratio is the technique employed in the present work to calculate the sensor radiance of the absorption channels and subsequently derive the total atmospheric water vapor content. Here we have defined the ratios uh, named as the R9, F, R17, R18, and R19, in which you can see that the B17, B18, and B19 are the absorption bands, and the B2 is the... Uh, uh, what do we call it? Uh, uh, sorry, window band. Again, the judges are asking yeah. for uh, just proceed to results. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Uh, after generating the uh, water vapor value uh, for the uh, channel number 17, 18, and 19 from the equation number one, two, and three that we can see into the back screen, uh, we have validated this water vapor value with the Terra Modis data. Uh, Terra satellites uh, Terra satellites observe every point of Earth roughly uh, every one or two day in 36 different spectra bands. This allows it to capture wide range of a wide range of information about the Earth's vital sign, including the cloud cover and, and a nearly a nearly daily basis. Uh, the sensor frequent coverage uh, and the spectral capabilities make it one of the most uh, comprehensive Earth's, uh, observation instrument available. Uh, please go to the back, uh, next slide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, you can say that the figure one is the more Terra Modis data of water vapor, uh, which uh, we have taken for uh, that you can, uh, which we have taken for the 8th of February, that uh, uh, date we have selected to retrieve the water vapor on that particular location that you can see into the figure. And the second number, uh, I mean, the figure B is the retrieved water vapor uh, from the band ratio method. So you can see the similarities between these two images. So uh, this is uh, the, uh, from these images, we can say that the, uh, 
uh, retrieval of uh, water vapor from the band ratio technique, uh, 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 this we have done is uh, 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 showing the very good results. And uh, uh, these are the actual, uh, I mean, a numeric value of the water vapor that was present into that into uh, present into atmosphere at that day. Uh, that for the 8th of February in the Anand region, that is retrieved water vapor was 1.327 gram per centimeter square, and the water vapor from the MODIS data was 1.336 gram per centimeter square. And we have also uh, uh, taken the value of water vapor from the sun photometer as an insight to data, that is 1.60 gram per centimeter square. So uh, from uh, this, uh, we can say that the Terra MODIS satellite data, uh, uh, we selected the Terra MODIS satellite water vapor data and sun photometer water vapor data for the validation of the retrieval of water vapor uh, from the band ratio technique. And from above a table, we can say that the retrieved water vapor with the help of band ratio method uh, and the water vapor from the sun photometer and Water vapor from the Theramod is uh, satellite data are very similar to each other. So we can say that uh, the water vapor retrieval from this band ratio tactic is uh, actually correct, which we have here proposed. So uh, that was my work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the uh, sorry for the hastiness and the hustle bustle that has happened because uh, some network issues and my PC is not working. Uh, I do apologize for that and thanks for allowing me to present my work.